very excited to share with you. We have two very special guests. Uh, we have Dr. Robert Enda, who's one of the co-investigators of the Average Child Experience right. Study, uh, and is also a medical scientific consultant to the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So, Dr. Enda, thank you Everybody. for coming. Uh, and Dr. he's going to talk to us most about you know how ACEs contributes to children's mental health issues. Well, thank thank you for having me here. Um, is it reasonable to assume that everybody knows what ACEs are? Is there anybody that doesn't? What ACEs are? So we know what ACEs are. Um, this, topic, this topic may be the most important topic on the planet, I believe. Um, mental health and children's mental health. I think mental health and substance abuse um, should be lumped together because they're just really part of the same thing if you look at the data. And, and, I'm, gonna, uh, and I'm gonna lead with the conclusion is that mental health and substance abuse, I believe, are the crossroads of the health of, of society. Um, they lead to so many things. They lead to the recurrence and intergenerational transmission of ACEs. Um, children that are exposed to ACEs grow up to have mental health and substance abuse problems that are a major um, transmitting agent to the next generation. And so, what I'm going to do is just briefly give you an overview of, of a little bit of bra about brain development. The reason why this is such a powerful phenomenon is that the stress of adversity is toxic to developing brain. Adrenaline and cortisol are released when we get stressed, and those two substances affect the way nerve cells make uh, connections and networks. Uh, in really high doses, um, those chemicals, the chemistry of stress can actually kill nerve cells. And when our kids, when our little babies are born, they're not wired up, and you probably know that. The wiring, the wiring is from the bottom to the top, from the lower part of the brain to the top of the brain and from the inside out. So if you want to think about a few things that can happen sequentially in brain development as children are exposed to ACEs or to neglect, which is not getting what you need to learn. The brain learns by experience through the senses. So, so when babies are born or if they, are, if, if they don't have a stable environment where there's a caretaker, they don't learn how to attach. They don't learn to have good, healthy social relationships. They may grow up to be people that don't recognize facial expressions very well. And if you can't do that, it's really hard to relate in society well. Um, uh, stressful environments, Lead to, lead to an increase in the parts of the brain that are involved in arousal and, and fight or flight. And, and that's really, that's, that's, that's an adaptive thing. An important part about understanding about ACEs is that, is that the response of the brain to the incoming sensory input is really adaptive. So some people get wired by being in chaotic or violent or scary environments to be ready to respond to that. And there are certain parts of the brain, especially low down in the brain, that actually get, get larger and more active as a result of exposure to stressful, scary things. So, so it's an adaptive process. Um, another thing to think about is, as you move up the, from the lower part of the brain to the center part of the brain, is where emotional regulation and memory functions occur. So as a child grows up and they begin begin to have that part of their, their brain develop, um, you get into things like anxiety, a tendency towards more anxiety uh, and depression, um, difficulty controlling emotions like anger um, because of the effects of the toxic stress on the brain and the kind of the way the brain adapts to the input that it gets. So, so we've got arousal, um, we've got emotional regulation, and the, ability, the interaction between arousal and emotion. Um, memory, the memory part, one of the uh, most sensitive parts of the brain that's involved in toxic stress is a part of the brain called the hippocampus. This involved in memory and a lot of other kinds of complex interaction functions that the brain does. And, and as, I, as I think of a child growing up, and this is kind of, we've got 10 minutes here, so this is broad brush strokes, but but you know the ability to learn. So so kids not learn not only math and reading and writing, but the ability to learn to interact with other people and to and to respond appropriately. And and it takes all of those things to be able to function in society. Um, 
things like specific things like math skills and reading skills, the parts of the brain that do that, and, and uh, retrieval, the ability to store memory, and it takes, there's things like flash memory and short-term and long-term memory, those things that you need to do to process information can be negatively affected by the effect of toxic stress on the cells that are build networks to do those functions. Um, executive functioning, which happens a little bit later, which is more in the front of the brain, which is your ability to kind of say, this is what I'm going to do next, or to tell yourself, yourself calm down and regulate your arousal and your emotions can be affected. And all of these things that happen, all of these things that happen are, these are interactive. These are interactive things. The brain is a rhythmic interactive organ. And so I don't think of mental health as you either have it or you don't. Some days I have it and some days I don't. <laughs> okay, but so it's really, it's, it's a continuum. And I think one of the things in terms of mental health that I think is really important to conclusion that I've come to is that the current systems which work kind of okay, which are based upon diagnostic coding saying if you meet certain checklists that you do or do not have a mental health disorder or emotional disorder, they're, they're useful, but most people who are exposed to ACEs probably don't fit neatly into any kind of mental health category or saying you have it or you don't have it. It's, it's, it's really an interactive um, set of problems. Um, I think, I think the, the, one of the reasons that I say that this is the crossroads of public health is, is that when you get someone who gets dysregulated, and dysregulated in terms of their ability to manage their anger or their arousal or their emotions, or even their cognition, the ability to focus and stay centered and their executive functioning leads down a pathway that is also adaptive. And some of those adaptations take the form of doing things that help you to cope. So if you're anxious or depressed, you're going to do something to try to quiet that because it's really painful. So, you know, kids, um, teenagers, you know, will find ways of coping. And a lot of time that, that takes the form of using psychoactive substances like cigarettes and alcohol and drugs. Um, um, some extremes that you see people like, um, if you see people who cut, cutting behavior. So there's all kinds of ways of, of trying to um, regulate the way we feel. Um, sexuality is a very powerful mood off, as we all know. Can well, may, I know. I don't know but, um, <laughs> is 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 a, is a really very powerful thing that that can change the way you feel. So so kids, part of the, and I believe this is all part of this continuum of of mental health. Is kids who are exposed to a lot of aces tend to be sexually active earlier. People with a lot of aces tend to have more sexual partners. And one of, a, one of the uh, uh, important outcomes of ACEs is teen pregnancy and teen paternity. Boys who have a lot of ACEs tend to get teenage girls pregnant. Um, suicide. It's a major contributor to teen suicide. And suicide in adulthood, but um, suicide is it, it, it's a huge contributor to suicide. We estimate that somewhere around 70 to 80 percent of suicide attempts have their origins in the toxic effects and the adaptations and the responses that the brain has to adverse childhood experiences. Um, so I'm, I'm going to go back to the idea of um, that this is a complex set of interactions and, and, and the, what we call multimorbidity or comorbidity. And those morbidities, the dysfunctions, are social emotional, cognitive, and then of course the physical health manifestations that go along with ACEs. There's a tendency, I think, when people look at ACE information is to focus on the gee whiz physical health findings that we first discovered out of this study. Like it causes, it seems to cause coronary heart disease and things like autoimmune diseases um, and lung disease. And, and that's all really important. But I think this topic of mental health and substance abuse is really the crux of the matter. And I know we have uh, somebody here from Corrections. Was it Corrections? Oh, Juvenile Probation. And, okay. Um, as you can imagine, I, that 
now that I had no idea of 10 years ago is that all these things are, uh, create pathways in life. And one of the pathways, powerful pathway that all these things lead to is if you don't do well in school and you can't concentrate and you can't interact with people very well or you can't manage your anger um, and you're scared in school and you miss out on what's going on, you're, gonna ha you're not going to be able to do your work. Um, you're going to have social problems in interaction with your peers and teachers and administrative people. And what do you see happens? And we have some data on this that, that we're going to share here, not during this time, but share later, is that, is that grade point averages are lower. Um, suspension and expulsions go way up as there's higher A scores. Um, the alcohol and drug abuse, the illegal behaviors and the teen pregnancy, all of those are a pathway into the criminal justice system. And um, the Children's Defense Fund calls that the cradle to prison pipeline. And I really, th that really I think is a, a very important aspect of all of this. Um, it's, it's, it's a biologic pipeline. And, and our society generates so many aces in the lives of children that it's a really big pipeline. And the data that I see looking at, at people in the juvenile justice system is that somewhere around 60 to 80 percent of kids that get involved in juvenile justice have diagnosable and usually untreated mental health and substance abuse disorders. And so the mental health aspect there is that we have these huge prison and justice systems and we have more people incarcerated in this country per capita than any other country in the history of mankind and they're really sort of holding bins for people that have been damaged by childhood adversity. Um, it's a pathway to low wage jobs, it's a pathway to homelessness and a pathway to poverty um, and all of these things all of these functions are interactive and, and they're continuous. Um, the data in terms of mental health data that astonished me when I first saw it about, about two years ago now is that as the number of ACEs go up and you look at psychiatric diagnoses, now this is in adults, but, and you look at the number of lifetime psychiatric diagnoses, people with no ACEs almost never have a diagnosed psychiatric disorder where the ACE scores are around zero. But as it goes up to one or two, three, up to four, five, six, and seven, you see people that have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, or eight DSM psychiatric diagnoses. And I don't, I, I don't know really what to say about that other than it's, it, it, that I don't think that that's a, a psychiatric disease. I think it's, it's it's a continuum of problems, and I think that we need to look at all of these things as a continuum, whether they're subtle or not so subtle, in terms of dealing with children's mental health and substance abuse, and, 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 and changing our systems. Changing our systems, especially as early as possible. I know Sunny works, what, first five. Um, I've seen her present, I've been out here. I don't know what city it was, what town it was. She took me so many places. But talking, talking with pediatricians about recognizing developmental delays in the first three years, I think, I think that is really an important thing to do. Children with developmental delays are likely to come, not necessarily, but are likely to come from homes where there's a lot of stress and adversity. And it can be an early intervention point so that these, they don't get so far down the pathway. And you can help the families and caretakers that are interacting with these kids to understand what's happening. They probably have, probably have their own ACEs, so you need to work with the whole unit to wind down the amount of stress that they have and reduce this pathway to poverty and the pathway to homelessness and mental illness and teen pregnancy and all these things that we've described in the ACE study. Um, and in schools, um, I know in, uh, in Laura State, Washington, and the state of Massachusetts, um, there's work being done to try to identify these manifestations in the classroom, the kind of behavioral and social and academic problems that children have in the classroom, and to begin to accommodate and change the way people interact with those children because the system responses, 
The system responses to these mental health and substance abuse problems are usually to punish them. And to me, that's the exact opposite of what we need to do because that's another stressor and it tends to kick people out of, out of systems. And once they get out of a system, if you think of a child that's suspended or expelled from school, and I'm, and I'm learning as I travel the country that there's kids that are suspended, expelled from preschool. And those are probably high, right, highest kids. So, so, th so is that, I can't imagine. So, so then who tracks them to say, well, we, we threw them out. Where do they go? And who's going to support them wherever they go? Wherever they're going is probably the place that created it. And so instead of making it better, it makes it worse. Um, how much time do I have? I, I, I could talk about this for a while. I'd like to maybe take some questions. But it's, a, it's such a huge issue. And you know, I'm glad you had me here to talk about it. Um, it really is um, it's heartbreaking to see the data on this. And you're going to see the data on this from Iowa, from adults in Iowa. You're going to have ACEs and the effect of ACEs on the health of the state of Iowa sometime in the next year probably and um, you'll be able to see that we sometime in the fall and and we were just talking a little bit earlier that you may have some some data um, um, proxies for ACEs and it you'll you know, help me yeah, it, <laughs> yeah to, to be able to show because because you know what what I just described is really is a I think is a universal human phenomenon everywhere it's been studied every every um, population in the US every state that's done it and now internationally you see the same pattern and it's because human it's we're, we're looking at human biology the biology of brain development and how we can mess that up by stressing kids and so okay, I don't so know how long I've well, talked but I will and um, Laura Porter is founder and staff director of the Washington State uh, Family Policy Council and continues to play a, ro a lead role in helping the state of Washington develop and implement community-based responses to ACEs. So thank you, thank you, Laura, for coming with us. And you're going to help us understand a little bit more of what you're doing in Washington State uh, that kind of incorporates mental health mm -hmm. uh, and addresses ACEs that, that way. And I'm Laura Porter, and I live and work in Washington State most of the time. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. When we first heard about the ACE study, we, um, we really saw the study as bringing together many things that, that we believed from a social justice point of view were really important. Um, we also saw a study that would provide us with a language <laughs> that we could use across disciplines and a language we could use that cross all different walks of life, all different professional roles, all different um, and the language that would help us unite the people of Washington to improve the future of health. And the study has done that, um, very much so. We're at the place where it's common in Washington to be in a community discussion and have people say, well, we speak ACEs here. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the main threads I want to make in terms of how we've approached using the ACE study is to, do, is to really do a saturation of education about it um, we always do education that includes some neurobiology, which you just heard um, Dr. Anda give you a quick summary, brilliant by the way, <laughs> um, and the, the ACE study, and really showing the data, showing um, charts and graphs, and in some audiences people say, I'm not a statistician, and they go away understanding more deeply for having seen some of the visual displays of the dose-response relationship between ACEs and difficulties in life. We always include something about resilience and embedded in our work is systems theory. Uh, so systems theory was developed in the corporate world uh, with multinational corporations that were working on change that was uh, in too complex a system to use command and control kinds of strategies. And the reason we turn to systems thinking and the field of systems thinking um, as a part of the education framework that we use is that we're really impatient. Uh, we really want transformational change. We want a shift in the trajectory of the public's health. And incremental change is just too slow. I mean, just maybe that's a personality <laughs> style, but we just wanted to make sure that we were taking action that had the potential of fueling a big systemic shift in our state. 
Uh, and so education is a key way to do that, but education without supports for action really doesn't get you very far because we all know better than we do. <laughs> and I'm sure all of us have experienced knowing many things that we ought to be doing and not figuring out how to navigate the actual action part in our lives. So we also have set up supports in Washington State um, that help people actually take action and a lot of that is pretty inexpensive. I mean, it has to do with illuminating impressive work, right? Just shining a light on when people have taken action that is um, quite remarkable. So I'm gonna give you some of those examples um, so that you can get a concrete sense of what's happening in Washington around children's mental health issues. Uh, we, we, took this, the, we took the approach, an empowerment approach essentially to um, providing education about adverse childhood experience. And so we have provided for, I don't know, over a decade, um, education to anyone and everyone, wherever the energy was, we would go. We trained 40, now 90, I just trained 50 more uh, speakers in Washington to deliver um, presentations from various vantage points about ACEs. And so uh, you see this ripple effect of, of people being able to teach their peers and their colleagues. And teaching is one of the best ways for uh, gaining knowledge. When you teach something, you have to read the articles behind uh, the presentation, et cetera. And so actually teaching professionals to train others about ACEs has been a professional development strategy we've used in Washington. And many of the people that are, uh, are now certified presenters are from schools and mental health facilities, um, hospitals, uh, corrections, et cetera. So many people just like you are now in their communities being presenters and that causes them to sort of deepen their knowledge on an ongoing basis and be the go-to person in a community uh, so that they're not reliant on a central office someplace for the information, which is really critical. We've also, um, we also know that people that are in therapeutic roles already probably are the ones who know a lot about trauma sensitive um, practice. They know a lot about um, what, what we can do to make life better for people that have experienced a lot of trauma. Uh, but they often don't have the kinds of community partners uh, that we can link to so that when uh, folks are in therapeutic environments that are set up as therapeutic environments, they walk out of that door and they walk back into a community setting, a neighborhood setting, a school setting, an after school setting, whatever, um, that, uh, that undoes a lot of what was done in the therapeutic setting. And so we decided it was important um, to approach children's mental health from the standpoint of aligning um, the mental health systems with the community, school, neighborhood organizing. One of the core facts findings from the ACE study is that ACEs are common. And that is a very, very short sentence that requires years of thought. At least that's been my experience. Because holding the fact that ACEs are common when we work in these deep end systems at some point, we all have this aha that they're too common to use deep end systems as our primary or our only tool. We have to get to the place where we're using the K-12 system, the neighborhoods, right, the families themselves as um, quasi-therapeutic environments for healing because there are just too many children, there are too many adults to expect that our deep end systems will ever be funded well enough to serve them. So that's a second major theme in our work is that we decided that it was important to use the knowledge and expertise of people who do trauma, um, trauma sensitive practice, um, trauma recovery work from a therapeutic standpoint as educators in neighborhood environments and we have provided small stipends to people to be available, for example, in many communities in Washington, uh, local leaders will use the World Cafe model. You familiar with that model for dialogue? It's an informal dialogue where folks are invited. You sit at small, it's called cafe because you sit at small tables of four like in a small cafe. Um, and uh, the dialogue has a central set of questions. 
And in many dialogues, what happens is you'll talk about the first question at your four-person table, and then uh, three of you will get up and move to another table and talk about the next question, etc. And what that does is place people in an environment where they can get to know others, but in a structured environment that has been intentionally designed to be very safe. And communities have designed uh, cafe series uh, so that they can bring parents in and intentionally design the series so that it's building the social network that has an understanding of the impacts of ACEs on emotional regulation, um, navigating physical space, being on time, attentional challenges, etc. So that the neighborhood as a whole is understanding some of those issues, but from a resilience point of view. So the discussion might be about the five pillars of resilience from the strengthening families uh, model or something that the neighborhood um, chooses. But those kinds of environments where um, people who, some people with high ACEs have a difficult time navigating the challenges of daily life and actually doing everything that's expected of them in a 24 hour period. So having social environments that are already set up that you're welcome to, whether you're on time or late, and where there's some care for the safety in the room is a powerful strategy, and I think it's working very, very well. We see communities that are using those kind of universal strategies, but they're structured, um, and they're very carefully designed in consultation with mental health professionals. Uh, we see the um, symptoms, mental health symptoms reduced. Uh, so we see uh, less symptoms of depression, less symptoms of anxiety in the um, youth survey and in the adult survey in Washington. So that's been a, one of our goals, is we may not be able to erase the effects of ACEs. In fact, I don't know that anyone knows how to do that. But if we can shift societal response so that we reduce the burden that ACE presents in a life, um, we have a better shot at adults then passing less ACEs to their children. Uh, in schools, we have um, three major initiatives in our state inside of schools. Um, one is perhaps the best well-known. It's called the Compassionate Schools Initiative. It's an initiative of our superintendent of public instruction. And it's really an initiative that's um, organized around uh, school personnel getting together with parents to develop a different climate in the school. Um, and it's it's um, established around some principles. I see heads nodding from school people in the room. Uh, there's a second in initiative that is led by Dr. Christopher Blodgett at Washington State University Area Health Education Center, or AHEC. Chris Blodgett is brilliant. Um, he is a psychologist. And Chris um, was doing work, actually, uh, he got a large grant um, to place mental health professionals in the police cars going on the domestic violence calls. And his thought was if, they, if there were mental health professionals in the room when mom or dad was taken to jail, the therapeutic environment could start right there. And what he learned from that work was, um, was one of the findings that Dr. Anda learned, and that is ACEs are common and ACEs are interrelated. They rarely come in ones. So he started thinking, oh my goodness, I was researching what to do in the deep end system and there are too many kids affected by ACEs for that to be the strategy. And he shifted the focus of his Child and Family Institute to systematically testing um, practices that teachers can do in a classroom, that administrators, that bus drivers, et cetera, can do. And so Chris Blodgett systematically testing um, practices for in-school shifts. Um, those shifts are about um, putting in place different uh, rhythms and traditions in the school. They're about um, professional development for teachers to be able to recognize a trauma response uh, as compared with another kind of response. Um, and uh, they're based on, um, is it the ARC model? Anybody flash on that? Uh, anyway, um, he, he talks, he teaches um, professionals how to attune first um, so that um, they can be relating using their physical body as a calming <laughs> um, because children are still young enough to be really 
mirroring a lot of our emotional um, psychological states and so uh, part of what he's teaching teachers is how to change self in order to create a safer environment for children so Chris Blodgett um, Chris Blodgett has discovered through his work that about 12 percent of our elementary aged kids um, have three or more aces by our high school classroom we're seeing about 42 percent having three or more aces so the combination of research in our state is telling us that along the way uh, there isn't just one age in which children are um, having this pileup of adverse childhood experience. It's all the way along the continuum. We also have uh, teacher education that's shifting to include um, ACE education both at Western um, Washington University and at the Evergreen State College. So there's a new flood of teachers coming into the classroom that are, we call it ACE informed. Uh, so that they can actually help the rest of the faculty on a peer-to-peer -peer basis understand the difference between holding kids accountable and punishing them for normal response to toxic stress. And that peer-to-peer -peer strategy, I think, is very powerful. Um, I know my daughter is a high school teacher. Uh, when she finished her master's in teaching and went into the classroom, she, she found nobody at her high school that knew about ACEs, and of course, it's it's dinner table conversation at our house. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, and, uh, and so she was able just to gently say, um, this person that we were going to expel, um, you know, I asked him what was happening that day, and this was his story. Could we meet in a different way with this child? And, you know, everyone was open to it. It just wasn't, it wasn't the way we do it, right? Uh, and so... Um, the schools are shifting the way they do things and having the confidence to know um, that people are testing so that they don't have to just invent and have no sense of what's going to work. Um, the Lincoln High School story, most of you know that story. If you don't, Google video of Lincoln High School. It's an alternative school in Walla Walla, Eastern Washington, rural um, town. And they uh, shifted everything about the way their school approaches education so that all education is really delivered through relationship. Um, it took a couple of years, but now their academic scores are going up, up, up. Uh, and so at first folks thought, well, this is just um, an environment that's about relationship and mental health, um, but now um, it's also an environment that's about better learning. And we know that neurobiologically, that if you can create a safer environment, you get better learning. In one more example in juvenile court, because um, in juvenile court, uh, we um, funded a trial where the, the juvenile court administrators said, we want to hold ourselves accountable for working with kids with high ACEs effectively. So they started looking at the juvenile um, risk assessment, which is the same risk assessment you use in your state, and looking at the ACE scores of youth. But they didn't look at the ACE scores of youth to learn about youth and whether youth were successful. They looked at the ACE scores to learn about themselves and whether they were successful, equally successful, with kids with high ACE scores, with kids with low ACE scores. And they found they weren't equally successful. Uh, and that some probation officers were much more effective with high ACE kids. And so they could create community of practice right inside the court, talking about why would you be better? I got the same training, and I'm pretty cool. They like me. Why are you better, right? And having that conversation about how do we as the adults take responsibility for uh, working better, more effectively with kids that have experienced trauma. So those are some examples, I think, from your particular point of view, probably relevant ones, but there are many. <laughs> Thank you.